Would you get your Bibles out and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Would you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? I'm continuing and ending the series on the power of unity. When I have the pulpit for the next several months, I'm going to be teaching verse by verse from the book of 1 Corinthians, but I'm doing it in little series. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, and 3 is a series on the power of unity. We covered chapter 1 a few weeks back, chapter 2 last week, chapter 3 today. Not all the chapters will be covered in one day. These have gone smoothly that we're able to do that because it's the main message has to do with unity. What I'd like you to understand is the Bible was written, or let me, let me put it a different way. In the New Testament, our Bible is made up of letters that were written by someone to someone else. Most of the letters in the New Testament were written by Paul the Apostle. Paul wrote a lot of letters and sent them to different churches, and then they have been canonized into our scripture, and this is the letter or the first letter to the church at Corinth, and the church at Corinth, or Corinth is a city, and this is the letter to them. This is not just to them, it is to all believers. It's a letter to every one of us. When Paul wrote his letters and when the other authors wrote their letters, they did not put chapter and verse in there. That was put in later uh, so that we could have reference points to jump to a certain place or to memorize scripture and help us to memorize it. Paul did not write chapter two, chapter three, because you'll find out in chapter three, the very first word is and, and you don't begin a chapter with and. It's kind of, you're going, what? And so some of the publishers, or when they got together and they, they chopped up the chapters and verses, sometimes they're not the best place. And you can't let it make you think that a thought has come to an end and a new thought has started. So it's very, very important that you understand that how these letters are written and how they're coming to you. And then, now we're about to go into, and I've been talking to you about the power of unity and the unity of the church coming together and the church being strong in one thing, and that's Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone. And that we've also looked in chapter two deeply from last week, and we found out that the world has wisdom and God has wisdom. And that the wisdom of the world cannot be compared to the wisdom of God. God's wisdom outshines, outdoes the world's wisdom. And God's wisdom makes the world wisdom look foolish. But the world's wisdom is trying to make God look foolish. The world's wisdom is literally the same as the world's gospel. The go there is a gospel that's being preached by the world. And that gospel is getting louder today than ever before. It is getting louder because of media that is allowing it to be louder. And I mean by that social media, uh, internet, television, radio, everything makes the gospel of the world louder and louder and louder. And as we get into the last days, and I believe we're in the last of the last days, the gospel of the world is getting louder. And the gospel of the world is, you don't need God. You can do it on your own. And we all need to take care of ourselves and we need to honor the planet more than we honor God. And that's basically the gospel of the world. Now, in that same thought process, God is very, very much concerned about clean air, clean water, about you having provision. In fact, I'd like you to take a moment and think from the eyes of God instead of the eyes of the world's wisdom. Why was the solar system made? Why was planet Earth made? Why did God create matter? Why did God create dirt? What was the intent behind all of it? It's very simple. When you read the Bible, you come to the conclusion, God did all of this for you. The entire world was created for humans to have joy, peace, fulfillment, and a life with God. The solar systems were created to support life on planet Earth. The solar systems were put into place and had to be into place probably for millions of years before the time was right for God to create man. God created man in his timeline, but he made sure that there was a place for man, and when he put man on planet Earth, he said, go and be fruitful. Enjoy. Have life. May you have an abundant life. But so many of us look at the creation as an accident, 
or there are a lot of Christians who believe that, you know, there was an explosion and they kind of take evolution and creation and blend it together. And maybe there was an explosion when God started it all. I would imagine when God said, let there be planets, boom, there they are. But I truly believe that every star, every planet, every solar system is there as part of the wisdom of God to give support so life can be on planet Earth and God can have a relationship with you. That God loves you so very much, so deeply, that he did all this so you and him could walk together at the cool of the day. We have to get a bigger vision of life, a bigger vision of what God's doing in everything, in all of our lives, to understand. Then you will also understand some of the messages that come from the Bible. The Bible is not... Let me add this thought, this one coming to my mind. God did not create the planet for, for you to be in prison. He didn't create the planet, planet Earth, and he didn't create you so that he could control you. He created you to have life, to have full fulfillment, fun, to laugh. Did you know God laughs? God is a creator of laughter. He's the creator of the tickle spots on your body. He is the creator of fun. Did you know God is the one that told man to have holidays and celebrations? God is for celebrating. And what we just need to do is realize God is not making rules or guidelines or directions for our lives to keep us in bondage, but to give us the place of pure freedom and joy that we're supposed to have. God isn't telling us to do something in the Bible or telling us not to do something in the Bible because he just likes to be controlling. He just says, I made you. I know your DNA. I know how you're wired. And if you follow my way, you'll find the most fun, the most laughter, the most enjoyment. So going now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and the power of unity, I want to remind you of our key scripture. I'll probably say this a lot through this whole book, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions. And this is really key right here. There's no divisions among you, that there be perfectly, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. So God is wanting us, and, and we're trying to understand that the whole purpose of this book is to get us all that there's no division. He wants to make sure you don't have any division. Division in the church, division in, in things. I don't know if you, you realize, though, there are churches that, have, that split, you know, the more modern church hasn't asked you your opinion on certain things. I don't know if you noticed, but like colors of walls in this building have changed and no one asked you. Uh, carpet changed several years ago and no one asked you. And, and you know what? That's, it's better because churches have actually split, broken off, destroyed because they argued on what color the carpet's going to be or what color the walls are going to be. Does it really matter? No. It doesn't matter. As long as it's clean, it doesn't matter. It's a place to worship. It's for us to gather. But let's not create things on purpose that would have division. And this is the key to 1 Corinthians. And you will find that every chapter of 1 Corinthians, every one of them points us back to no division, points us back to community, points us back to unity, brings us into living in community. And then that's kind of like the overthing of every chapter, but then there are other individual spotlighted things in the chapter that are going to be very challenging. For an example, when we get to chapter four, we are going to start a new series. We get to chapter five, and I'll give you a warning sometime the end of June, sometime the end of June, 1st of July, we'll be talking in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, and we'll be talking, and it'll give you a heads, heads up right now, there will be a lot of talk about sex, because that's what the chapter talks about. The chapter talks about sexual immorality that got into the church and how it can divide the church, and we got to get back to no divisions. So uh, we're just going to go through it and let the Bible say what it needs to say, 
and I'm glad that you are going to stick with me through it. And when you do get offended, you, you go to lunch and get over it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, begin at verse 1, and again, I'm going to point out the word, the very first word, the word and. And I, brethren, which we, I tied this in last Sunday. If you weren't here last Sunday, or you didn't hear my message on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, go back and understand, because we went through the first couple of verses, and it ties into that last statement that he's making. And I, brethren, could not speak to you to as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. Paul wanted the church of Corinth to be much further along than they were. Here's the the issue of Corinth. Corinth has had some tremendous Bible teachers. They have heard Aquila and Priscilla. They have heard Apollos. They have heard Paul. They've had some traveling ministers come through the city who are strong in the word of God, and they are strong in God's word. And they are very advanced in the the normal church and moving in spiritual gifts. This is a church that is really popping in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, miracles are happening in the church. Gifts of healings are in operation in the church. Spiritual giftings are, are, are moving very freely. And Paul says, you're babes. You're just children still. And you should be much further than that. And the, then he says in verse two, I fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you still are not able. Paul's not in the city writing this letter. He's heard about stuff going on in the, in the church, in the city of Corinth, and he's writing the letter and said, you are still acting like children. It's time for you to get your big boy, big girl pants on and stand up and take your place in this world and start doing stuff for Jesus Christ. Instead of trying to get the church to always do something for you, he says, it's time for you to do something for I was a little kid when I heard a very famous president say, it's not what you could do for your country. The country could do for you, but what you can do for the country. Some of you have never heard that statement. Hopefully, it will get back to public schools soon. And when you study history, but Mr. Kennedy was awesome. Hey, I I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. This word for carnal is in reference to, that means you as a Christian are leaning more towards being influenced by your flesh and the desires of your flesh than you are by the desires of the Holy Spirit inside your heart. And it's time for Christians to start to become more spiritual than more carnal. And when he uses this term for you being carnal, he is referring to you need to stop going after just you. And you need to start thinking about the whole church and the community as well. He goes, for you are still carnal, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And when, you, when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and are you not carnal? So here's he says, for one of you say, I am of Paul, I am of, of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to? He's about to go into this talk about how to stop division and how to be unified by using him and Apollos as examples. And what we have here, and he says, when you say, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm an independent, I'm this, I'm that, I'm Gen Z, I'm Gen X, I'm baby boomer. As soon as you start to divide everybody into small groups, you begin letting division in. Are we not the church of Jesus Christ? Made up of many different age groups, many different people, many different thoughts, but don't we not become one in Christ? You cannot pick your little circle or your identity. You are not a Republican and then a Christian. You are not a Democrat and then a Christian. You are not an independent and then a Christian. You could be an independent Christian. You could be a Christian that's a Democrat. You, and I know some people think that's impossible, but it is. There's a lot of Democrats who believe in Jesus Christ. There are a lot of Republicans who believe. But you know what? Politics is not our identity. Our identity is the cross. 
Our identity is the blood of Jesus Christ. Our identity is our salvation. Our identity is our future in heaven. That's whom we're supposed to identify with, and that's what we should. So now Paul says, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? This name, Apollos, keeps coming up in this book. And so I thought I'd at least answer the question, who is Apollos? Apollos, he was born in Alexandria, Egypt, by Jewish parents. He was mentored by John the Baptist. He became a great speaker but he was under the doctrine of John the Baptist, and he became very well known in the places he would go and speak. He de- he, um, the Bible describes him as an elegant speaker, full of scripture, and then around AD 54, he shows up in Ephesus. Paul has already started the church at Ephesus. Paul has left Ephesus. Apollo comes in, Apollos comes in, He begins teaching scripture in Ephesus, and Aquila and Priscilla live in in Ephesus at the time. Aquila and Priscilla, who have been mentored by Paul himself and have now become teachers of the word of God and, and discipling people in the city of Ephesus, take Apollos to the side and find out that he's following John the Baptist. They mentor him, and he becomes this giant in the city of Ephesus. He becomes one that helps leads the church and influences is the church and a very, very good speaker. So you have Paul and you have Apollos. I'd be Paul. Pastor Josh would be Apollos. Um, But uh, Paul is trying to say, you don't get to pick. You don't decide what's going to happen here. So uh, Apollos was a leader in the church for a season. So here's what he says. Here's what Paul says. I plead I, I, excuse me, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And I, this is so important. It's God that gives the increase. One will plant, one will water, but God is the one that gives the increase. In other words, Paul is trying to communicate, I, Apollos, team, all right? So we have a team working together, but it's God that's doing the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, neither he who waters is anything. Paul says, I'm nothing. He says, Apollos is nothing. We're simply doing our job. We're simply doing what we've been called to do. But God who gives the increase is something. Our identity should not be in who taught us. It should be in the one who sent the teacher. That's Jesus Christ and God the Father. Then it says in verse 8, now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And here's where some stuff starts to change and you can get shaken in your boots. And you should be thinking deeply about the next several verses that are coming up. And Paul introduces something to the church of Corinth that no one's talking about and no one's talking about it today either. He says, now he who plants is And he who waters are one. And this is the whole thing. Stop the division. Be one. It's not Apollos or Paul. It's God who is speaking through both. And they are both emphasizing something different. Why? To have unity and have whole. So we can all be together. And he says, and he receives his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. And this word for fellow means we're on the same team. We are his fellow workers. You, referring to the church at Corinth, you are God's field. You are God's building. Paul calls the church the field of God. Paul calls the church the building of God. Now think about that for a moment. When you go to a building and you see this elegant building, this wonderful looking building, this beautiful structure, do you actually jump immediately to the company that laid the concrete foundation? Do you think about the guy who had a rivet gun and put some rivets into some steel beams? Or do you think about the architect? You're going to think about the architect. And the architect is God. You're the building. But God is building you, and he's stepping back, he and all the world, to say, what a building. It's called the church. It's called, pretty awesome. Verse 10, 
according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. And it, it all came by the grace of God. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one, let each one, and here's uh, some emphasis, each one take heed how he builds. This all of a sudden comes into two categories immediately, and Paul's talking to two groups. He's talking to the group that are the teachers, and he's talking to the group that are the building you. He's saying that you need to take heed how you build on this foundation, and the other teachers need to take heed how they build on the foundation. You need to take heed on how you listen, and they need to take heed on how they are speaking, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is the foundation. This is the cement slab that we're all building on. Then he says, and now if anyone builds on this foundation, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, the day, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And the each one that he's referring to, this one, this each one's work, again, is in two categories. Number one category is you, it's listening and building on your own foundation and building up your own understanding of scripture. And number two is the person doing the preaching. Person doing the preaching now is also has to be accountable for it because each one's work is going to be revealed. And look at verse 13. Each one's work will become clear for the day. The word, the phrase, the day, is referring to the day, referring to the day that you stand in front of Jesus Christ and you give account for your life. It's going to happen. And that's something no one's preaching. Nobody's preaching accountability at the day. The day is coming where you'll stand in front of Jesus Christ and you have to give account for your life. The day. Let's, let's go on and see. Paul, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, trying to get a church back on track, reminds them of the day. The day. The day. You know, whenever you get off track, whenever you start to, like, wonder, you start getting, going away, wandering here or there, you need to think of the day. It will kick you back into on-trackness. I make words up just to keep you awake. Okay, let's go on. Uh, then here's what I would like you to grasp and understand. This is not scripture, this is my note. There is a difference between going to heaven and being rewarded in heaven. There's a difference between going to heaven and and being rewarded in heaven. I'm going to go to this next scripture where I'll talk about it and say, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Okay, so let's take you as an individual, and you are now going into, I don't know why, but this is coming to my head. These are pearly gates, and this is heaven. And you're going to go into heaven, okay? How do you get to heaven? Okay, it's amazing. I am amazed at the amount of people living on planet Earth today who believe they get into heaven by being a good person. If they're good. I'm also amazed by how many Christians believe I get into heaven by the blood of Jesus, but if I do something really bad as a Christian, I could be kicked out of heaven. Okay, let's just go with the Bible. Let's just talk about what the Bible says. The Bible says that you go to heaven because you believe in Jesus Christ. Getting to heaven, getting in the gate, getting in the home, getting in the mansion, getting in the house is nothing by what you have done. It's all by what Jesus has done. The only thing you have done is believed it and said, I receive it. Jesus, come into my life. You get into heaven for free. It's a free gift. God, since the day Adam and Eve sinned, has been pulling people out of hell, putting them into heaven. You get into heaven for free, 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 free. Like this 
mattress commercial. <laughs> you get into heaven for free. Now, now let's, let's do this, okay? I want you to think of, I'm going to do this. This really odd looking thing is a, is a, you think it's a chair, it's a throne, okay? And God is sitting on the throne and there's all kinds of light coming out of it. And you are now in heaven. You've made it in heaven. Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? What is your social status? How will you live is now determined by you today. You will be rewarded for your life of faith today, which will result in after you are in heaven. And that's what no one's preaching. Everyone thinks that heaven is socialism and that everybody's equal. Heaven's not socialism. Heaven is in all equality. Your place in heaven isn't going to be determined by the color of your skin or your sex. It's going to be determined what did you do with the name of Jesus after you accepted him as Lord and Savior. It's going to be determined by what you did. And Paul wants to bring the church back into unity, back into no division, back into a place of power by remembering there's a day coming, guys. And this life on this planet is very serious and very important. What are you doing with your Christian faith? How are you serving the Lord? You do not get into heaven because you gave a lot of money, because you prayed a lot of hours, because you went to church a lot. But now listen. You, huh? I don't know where that came from. Hold on a second. All right. You get, once you are in heaven, you are going to have the day. It's going to look at what you have done in this life, and it's going to be rewarding to you, and you are going to receive rewards for what you did. Those rewards are your capital in heaven. I've heard people say, oh, oh I just want to get to heaven. I just want to get to heaven. Why? Why not get to heaven and live? Why not have a wonderful place in heaven? Why? Now, I said, you do not get to heaven because you prayed a lot, because you gave a lot of money, because you attended church. But every time you attend church, you get rewards for it. Every time you give faithfully out of faith, you get rewards for it. Every time you witness about Jesus Christ, you get reward for it. Every time you live by faith, you're rewarded for it. Every time you stay in your place and hold to patience, long-suffering, and following the faith, and not giving up, you get rewarded for it. It gets into your bank account. That bank account is going to be used in heaven. Again, we're not all equal in heaven. Let us trumpet that loud and clear that people can understand and grasp it that you need to realize there is a day coming. And it says in first, um, verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself, he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. In other words, even though you have no rewards with you, you're still going to heaven because Jesus did it. You don't get into heaven because you earned it, because you're good enough. There is no human good enough that does it. You're good. Your very, very, very best good is stink. It is dung in the nose of God. By his grace. So, well, Pastor, this sounds like hellfire and brimstone. I don't care what you call it. I'm just going to call it the scripture. This is in the Bible. And he says that, it says here, yet he himself he himself will be saved through fire. So we get to verse 16. 
What happened to verse 15? Was verse 15 there? Oh, there it is. Sorry. We'll get to verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You are the temple. Now, here's something that's pretty interesting. This is, this, we're going to get into some really challenging, hard scripture. The word temple is used for the inner part of the temple in Jerusalem. It is referred to or is also known as the sanctuary. And I don't know why this is messing up. It's because the devil doesn't want you to know about the day. And it, now here's what I'd like you to, to grasp. Do, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Listen here. The words you are are in the second person plural. It's not talking about a single individual. It's talking about a group of people. He said that you are the, the temple of God. So now we go over to verse 17. If anyone defiles, look at this word, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which the temple you are. Left alone and people will make a doctrine off one Bible verse. This is a tough verse. This is a very challenging Bible verse. Left alone all by itself, people have made doctrine out of this and said, as soon as you sin, God's going to destroy you. But it has to agree with the rest of Scripture. What you need to grasp is understanding in this Bible verse that says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And being in second person plural, he's referring to the sanctuary, the temple, the church that God looks at us as a group, as a, as a, in unity, and if someone comes in here to destroy the church, God's going to destroy them. Here's what's really interesting. This Greek word for defiles and the Greek word for de the word destroy are the exact same word. The same Greek word. You could say this. If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will defile him. It says, for the temple of, of God is holy, which temple you are, referring to the group of the church and saying if the, someone tries to come against the church. If you look at history, when people attack the church, they go down. The church rises. And then we get to verse 8. Um, oh, here's, I want to jump over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. And the reason I want to do that is, does God destroy the church or the temple? And here's what he says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I, this is God, I will come to you and quickly, um, come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is one of the letters written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus Christ had Paul, I mean, John the apostle, dictate when he was telling them what to do. And what he's saying here is he's telling this church that if you don't repent from this, I'm going to come and remove your lampstand. If you do any kind of research on it, you're going to find that the lampstand, that the lampstand most likely is the pastor and that the angel of that church is most likely the pastor. He said, I'm going to come and remove the light. And God is saying that as a church will get off track of the gospel God removes the light from that organization. We have so many historical events that this is true in our country. Every Ivy League university college started out as a Christian college. Now they're the most secular social group on the planet. Why? Because the lampstand's been removed. Why? Because God said, I'm gonna de you destroy it, I'll destroy you. And the lampstand has been removed. So first, back to chapter 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And wise in this age, being wise in this age is wise in the wisdom, and the wisdom of this world. And we have a whole bunch of people right now telling the church that we should change our doctrine from what we've learned from Scripture pertaining to a lot of social issues to match the rest of the world because the world's evolving. The issue is the world isn't evolving. It's got the same problems it always has when it leaves God. 
Remember what I told you at the beginning of this talk. That God's will, God's scripture, is here for the purpose of helping us find true freedom and happiness. Our bodies, when we are carnal, fight against all that God has, and they're trying to make sure that we don't follow God. And if we don't follow God, if we don't follow God, we don't have inner happiness, but we try to tell the rest of the world we have outer happiness. Now, there's stuff that's happening socially in our life right now that we are being bombarded with the wisdom of this world or the wise of this world. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. The word deceive means to cause someone to have misleading or erroneous views concerning the truth or to mislead, to deceive, or deception. He says, let no one deceive himself. Let no one have erroneous views of scripture or of God. You want to know what God feels and thinks? It's going to be this. For an example, and I know that every time I say this and in this book is going to deal with it in detail, we will take a deep dive in it several chapters away. For an example, God's made man and out of man, he pulled woman. And he said, this is a man and this is a woman. And if the two come together, they're going to leave their mom and dad, their parents, and be joined together to have happiness, fulfillment, and life. In that creation, God said, this is where you'll find the greatest happiness. This is where it will be. Now, there's going to be a few things I'll have to say in the weeks to come that I'm going to have to put on the board and use abbreviations to talk to you about. Because if I say it, I get tagged by YouTube and I don't want to get kicked off YouTube. And I don't want to get kicked off YouTube because it's a place of the gospel being preached and we're reaching people. So I'll use the board to relate to a few things, but here's the ultimate that you need to know. The challenges that we're all facing today when it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, when it comes to identity, sexuality, when it comes to uh, sex out of marriage or in marriage, when it comes to these things, God has designed it and built it to give you the most, absolute the most happiness. Not to give you the most restrictions, the most happiness. So, well, I'm, I'm troubled then. Why is it that I know people who are doing things outside of the will of God and seem to be happy. They're, they are not proof that God is right or wrong. God is right because he said so. But God said it because he had you in mind. Ultimate long-term happiness is with you in mind. We cannot use the fallen state of humans because of Adam and Eve, and the further we get from Adam and Eve, the greater sin can get. We cannot use our fallen state as an excuse that God made me this way. No, he didn't. God made us a different way, but we're dealing with sin. And as we deal with sin, we deal with our own flesh. Paul is bringing the church of Corinth back into a place of understanding that you are going to be accountable one day for your actions when you get to heaven, how many rewards do you want? Do not be deceived. Do not have erroneous views of, of Scripture. Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness, foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And the wisdom of this world wants to use to, to talk and speak against God. It wants to use conclusions, feelings, science. It wants to use social groups of people. Like, here's a whole group of people. And if God was truly a God of love, wouldn't he want them to be happy? Yes, that's why he wrote the scriptures. He wants everyone to be happy. It's his desire. It's his will. It's what he wants. He wants all of us to be happy. That's why we have this book. And the book will lead us to absolute ultimate happiness, and one day you're going to die, and don't you want some rewards in heaven? Okay, and we're wrapping up the book, this chapter. 
And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are fru fruitile, and therefore let no one boast in man, for all things are yours. Now he's about to go, don't boast in how much you know of the world's wisdom, boast in how much you know the, the will of God, and that you're living in the will of God and walking in the will of God. And the church isn't supposed to, and right now there's a lot of churches, a lot of churches who have decided that it's more profitable to take on social progressive views in society for their church to show you how great and wonderful and compassionate they are. If you're really truly compassionate, tell people the truth. Tell them there is a hell and there is a heaven. Now, I'm going to pause because someone just thought this. Okay, pastor. If we're going to go to heaven, that's a very crude heart. If we're going to go to heaven, then are you telling me that people who don't do what we've been talking about, or if they misbehave sexually, Oh, I'm just going to lay it out on you right now because you're going to get so. Uh, some are going to be mad. Some are going to be relieved. But uh, let's just be kind about what God says. If I'm going to go to heaven, can I go to heaven as a homosexual? Can I go to heaven as a transgender? Can I go to heaven as someone who has sex outside of marriage? Can I go to heaven... Can I go to heaven if I have sex with a, a child? What's the answer? The answer is this. Your behavior, now listen close, or I'll have to come to your house and call you a liar if you misquote me. The way to heaven has nothing to do about your behavior. Zero. Zero. Nothing to do about your behavior. The way to heaven has to do about your faith. Follow me. It's going to be because of faith. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, and he was raised from the dead three days later, and that he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and you call on his name to be saved, you're saved. What? Wait a minute, Pastor. You're telling me, well, what about that scripture that says that if you're a homosexual, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God? It also says a liar in the same chapter, same verse. And it's in this book. Wait till we get there. It's coming. But here's what I want you to grasp and understand. Christianity, salvation is for all sin. Tell me the sin that kicks you out. Said, well, what happens if you, the, someone says they're a Christian and they're a practicing homosexual? What's the difference if they killed someone? There is no sin that's going to kick you out of heaven. But what you need to grasp and understand is it will prevent you from your rewards in heaven. You are not building rewards, living in a lifestyle outside of the will of God. Let me ask you, the, what's the difference between the sin of homosexuality or the sin of adultery or the sin of fornication or the sin of a man and a woman having sex regularly who are not married? What's the difference? Why do you pick one? Why do you pick the one that you think is the worst? Now, some of you are going to be really mad at me, and I hope you don't leave the church over it, but I want you to grasp, and if you are so upset that you're thinking about, I'm going to have to leave the church because I don't agree with him, call me up, make an appointment, let's sit down and open scripture. I want you to know that the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ is what paid us to get into heaven. Now you get into heaven, and think about it. I, I, I was in a, in a home with um, two married women. They invited me to the home, sat down there, and um, we were talking, and they're asking questions, and um, I made this statement, because I knew it was going to hit them. I said, right to them, I said, there are no homosexuals in heaven. And they both, 
And then I said this, there are no heterosexuals in heaven either. Right. Sex is not a heaven issue. Right. It's an earth issue. And what I'm sharing with you, you say, well, pastor, does that mean Christians should hate homosexuals? <laughs> oh, gosh, I wish we could go to this chapter. In this book, Paul tells you, I didn't tell you to not have dinner with homosexuals or sexually sinned people or earthy people. No, because to do that, you'd have to leave the earth. What I told you is don't have them with people in the church who practice that. Okay, let's back up. We are called to love everybody. We are called to embrace everybody. We are called to share the love of Jesus, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the kindness of God with everybody. What you need to know is if a person is practicing some kind of sin, some kind of behavior that is not scriptural or healthy, God is working through his Holy Spirit constantly trying to help them to get free from it and to get released from it. God is not hating you. God doesn't hate you because you have a sin or a behavior that he's saying, no, it's really not my will. It's really not my place. It's really not what I want you to do. He's not hating you because of that. He'd hate all of us. Again, what's, what's the difference between somebody who is a practicing homosexual or someone who's a practicing liar? I know some Christians who are really good liars. They can't tell the truth. Isn't that also a sin that they need to break free from? There are no murderers in heaven. There are no homosexuals in heaven. There are no heterosexuals in heaven. There are no adulterers in heaven. There are no liars in heaven. Why? Because when you get to heaven, you're on a new body. That may have been your past. That is not your future. That may have been what you were. It is not who you are. You may even be caught up in it and trying to get out of it, but God doesn't see you that way. He sees you redeemed. He sees you relieved. He sees you delivered. And that's the purpose that we are here to find freedom. Part of our call is to find, yeah, let's clap. Let's, yeah, I need that break. Part, part of it is, is the call to being free. And so let's, let's get the... Um, Let's get another scripture up here. Let's close this. Verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Cephas is another name of Peter. Uh, the word Peter means stone in um, Hebrew. It's Peter. And in Arabic, his name is uh, Cephas. Whether Paul or Apollos or, Ce- or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Then he says here, and you are Christ and Christ is God's. You are Christ and Christ is God's. And he's trying to say that you, all of us, all of us with our junk, all of us with our sins, all of us with our shortcomings, all of us with our faults, all of us with our trying to get this thing out of our life, we are all one in Christ. And Christ is in us, and we are Christ, and Christ is working for us to quit having division, start having unity, start having freedom, and more people making a difference. We need to be people who are striving after the spirit of the living God, not through judgmental actions or words or behaviors, but through finding freedom and living free in Jesus Christ. Well, I tell you, um, the sermon went a different way than any of my notes indicate. They, that wasn't there, that wasn't there, that wasn't there. Um, in this book, this book, 1 Corinthians, is actually going to get deeper. Get to chapter 5, we find out a man is living with his stepmom and having sex with her. That's weird. Well, not for us, I guess. Everybody thinks that's okay. But Paul deals with the social issues of the day, but he brings everybody back to unity. 
And the one thing that we have to walk away from today is this. The day is coming. What are you doing with your life as a believer? Are you living for you as a carnal, fleshly person? Or are you living for Jesus? Does that mean you have no mistakes, problems, or sins? Not at all. But it does mean is you have victories and victories. We'll develop wood, hay, stubble. We'll develop gold, silver, precious stone. But one day there is a fire coming and it's going to burn all your wood, hay, and stubble and junk. And what will be left is your rewards. You collect that and go into heaven. What I want you, I want the people of the Church of Grace to live in the best place in heaven because you are living your faith. And as we go deeper in this book, we'll, we'll share because he goes further into what's going to come at the end times. But we'll share with you that it's not by doing a whole bunch of stuff. It's doing what's before you and doing it in faith and doing it in unity. It's supporting missions trips. It's helping reach the poor. It's being involved in as we, as a church, we're involved in helping through Motel Church, helping with Coffee Cup in the sense of walking out into the street, helping the homeless, helping the lost, helping the hurting, feeding, delivering, visiting people in prison, visiting people that are hurting, helping people find freedom, not having someone come in and say, you know what, I have a a current involvement I had a a woman who left her husband to live with another woman. And everybody's a Christian. And that woman came to me privately and said, I need to talk to you. And we sat down and talked for two or three hours. Just lovingly, kindly, openly with Scripture. This is what the Bible says. At the end of that talk, she said, I need to leave my girlfriend and go back to my husband. I said, yes, you do. And she did. It wasn't through, what's that term that they use for, I wasn't trying to brainwash her, I wasn't trying to uh, convert her through uh, counseling. I I was just telling her what the Bible says and how that would absolutely lead to inner happiness and more fulfillment and a greater life in heaven. We just need to follow the word of God. And sometimes following the word of God isn't easy. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's emotionally struggle for you to give up your girlfriend or boyfriend to follow Jesus. It's a price to pay. But Jesus paid a big price for you. Let's just put it in perspective. Okay, I gotta, I, there's nowhere to stop. I just stop and ask you to bow your head. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? The first prayer is, as everyone gets to lunch, they will not crucify the pastor. In the name of Jesus. Second prayer, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, if you've never made Jesus your Lord, today's the day that you need to do it. It doesn't matter what's been going on in your life. He wants you in his family. So right now, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, you watching online, I ask you, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, just ask him right now, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Save me. And he will, he will do what he said he will do. Amen. Amen.